there we go. Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi. There we Hi. Go. Hey. <laughs> and I'm realizing I, I'm going to go close that because it's super messy. But no, no worries. No, it doesn't matter. Well, it's up to you if you want. You're welcome to. Yeah, no worries. I'll just close it real quick. Yeah, I should have. All right. Hold on just a sec. No, no worries. Also, I'm, I'm happy to see you guys. Yeah, <laughs> we're happy to see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's such a pain with my desktop. It's just like I've tried a million different things and I can be reasonably techy, but like this one eludes me. So no don't worries. know why. So but weird. my laptop is pretty, pretty stable. Let me close that real quick. Okay. okay no worries. Cool. When people joke when people come over and they haven't been to our house before, I'll jokingly when I show them my office, I'll say, Welcome to the sanitarium. <laughs> <laughs> now please take a seat on the couch and yeah. tell me all about your problem. <laughs> tell me everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have air conditioning actually, because you, you don't normally need it in northern yeah. california so i've got like the room darkening curtains up uh -huh. um, oh, yeah. to try to keep the heat from that's being smart. really bad so that's you know hence i've got the light on otherwise yeah 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 okay, cool. it's pretty that's warm already <laughs> yeah oh yeah. yeah it's it's already yeah i i would be wow. wearing a tank top right now except i was not totally sure <laughs> if this was going to be video or not because i always Waking at dawn. Cool stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Kate Soboda. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's so cool. We've actually had this booked in for a fair few months now. We've been speaking with uh, Jen, who's your virtual assistant, and she's been really, really cool. So uh, thanks, yeah, just for this opportunity. Oh, no, thank you for having me. And yeah, we all love Jen. Jen's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So uh, you mentioned that it's uh, stifling hot where you are right now and like it's uh, midday and you got all the windows and stuff closed there. Um, and actually one of the other things which was really interesting when I was just doing the research, um, you know, about you and your story was that you have a very eclectic taste in music. So I was just kind of wondering what is uh, playing in the background today? Um, okay, so this has been a thing lately. Um, I feel it, it, it usually isn't in the background when I'm working. I don't usually listen to music when I'm working, but I have been listening to um, Beyonce's Formation the, from the Homecoming Live playlist mm. on Spotify. Um, specifically that song, something about it. I, I mean, I saw the Homecoming uh, documentary on Netflix and was just, you know, jaw dropping the whole way. And then the other one is Lizzo juice. Lizzo juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I don't know. Like, I love how much she, you know, she's, she's like, I love, I, you know, I, I saw an interview with uh, her and Trevor Noah on the daily show okay, and cool. I just loved her energy, loved her, her way of being and then listened to juice. And it's just, nice. it's like, you know, She's like, I love myself so much, it's dangerous. So <laughs> I, I think that's what it arouses in me. Yeah. Oh, classic. Oh, so cool. Isn't it interesting? Some people just thrive on like listening to music while they work. Like I, I, I really like having music on when I'm working. And then other people just, when they work in, they just have to switch everything or has to be dead silence and then they can go. But it, 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 it's so interesting how everyone can be so different with that, you know? Oh yeah. I can't, I can't work with stuff going on in the background. Um, yeah, no, I, I gotta have the quiet. So yeah, I, I'm the exact same. I'm like, I, I just cannot have like, like I'm, I'm getting better now with maybe some sort of background music or background beats. That's okay. But anything with words and it just confuses me with yeah. like the work. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. So, so Kate, as mentioned, our podcasts are all about people's stories, and um, you know, we so we're wondering if you could sort of maybe take us back to those early days of growing up in Missouri in the Midwest, and yeah, just tell us what it was like. Hmm. hmm. Like what? What's what's going to be the thread that roots down? Um, well, I I think that one of the, the great gifts that I really had from childhood was that my parents didn't really push me to um, succeed in a way that was, um, I could be very goal directed. So it's like, you know, when I think of my childhood, I'll often think of hours that I got to spend alone 
uh, playing Barbies, running around with kids in the neighborhood, making up stories, teaching school. Um, we, I, I grew up in a house across the street from an elementary school and they, the school district decided to close down that school due to budget funding. And the, you know, when they came in to close down the school, they put these dumpsters outside the school and just started throwing everything into dumpsters, mm -hmm. including like um, textbooks and actual like school desks that children would have used. It's really, frankly, quite horrible because mm -hmm. I'm sure most of it went to a landfill. But, mm -hmm. you know, my younger sister and I, we, we dumpster dove and like pulled like school desks and textbooks and wow. stuff out of the dumpsters. And then in the attic of my father's house made a school room, you know, and like had wow. like, you know, teachers, uh, ABC up on the, you know, we knew our ABCs, but like just to make it like a school and have actual desks, like with the flip top lid wow, that you could cool. sit at. And, um, and that was how we spent our time. And it wasn't like this, you have to go to swim practice, piano practice, math tutoring. Da -da. It was just very like, get your homework done, get good grades. You know, you do have to pass your classes, but get your homework done. And other than that, you, like, you do you. And I think that gave me a lot of independence and self-directed time that ends up kind of being part of who I am today. And I mean, you know, books, that's the other thing that comes to me is like, is there anything better than going to the library and getting a stack of books, you know, this high and just like, yeah, just like a real passion for learning and curiosity and, and different perspectives. What do people think? You know, that's, that's some of what I think of when I think of that time. Yeah. I that's am. so cool. You don't often, you know, hear of people that would necessarily want to play school, but that definitely says something about <laughs> you and your hashtag your nerd. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that kind of thing, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, in part two, because I know that you guys have dug into some some stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like it's you know that might be something of a rosy picture of how it looks. I also think that you know, with whatever tension, stress, fear, challenges I grew up with, that also became an outlet. Like, and that was something that. I'm really grateful for because I, I go, you know, what would I have done if I had not learned how to take what I was going through at that time and funnel it into something productive? Like what if it had been mm. something else, something really self-destructive? Cause for a lot of people that is the route that it ends up becoming. So, um, you know, like, like it, and it, and it can today be the yin yang, right? Because like there's, there's being goal directed in a way that I think can be really healthy and like, Oh, this is a passion. And then there's being goal directed and that can turn into overwork. And I can absolutely own that when I am really stuck in my fear, my impulse is to go into workaholic mode because mm -hmm. you know, it, it, part of that impulse was honed when I was a kid, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and were there any books that kind of like stand out for you as a kid that you remember? Oh gosh, you know, nothing that sounds very like high art, right? Like, uh, I mean, I don't even know if you guys would be familiar with them, you know, Babysitter's Club and Sweet Valley High. I just love to read and I love to read magazines, but something shifted around the time that I was 14 and I was, you know, I would go to the library, speaking of hot days, you know, growing up in Missouri without air conditioning, it was really hot during the summer. And right, the, right around the time I was 14, I um, was at the library on a hot summer day because it had air conditioning <laughs> and I like books. And I, I wandered into uh, the poetry aisle and, and found Allen Ginsberg. And I remember really reading Mind Breaths. You know, I know that Kiddish and um, a number of you know his other poems are are far Howell is far more popular, well known. Um, but Mind Breaths happens to be what I picked up, and then I started looking through the rest of his poetry. And um, Mugging was actually the poem that I I really felt drawn to, but um, just loved his free form style. Loved how he was just like. Um, F it all. I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like, you know, just fuck it all. This is who I am. 
you know, and there are poems at 14, you know, I was growing up in Missouri, which is very conservative. Um, I identify as a woman, I identify as heterosexual, and to read his poems about um, homosexual sex between men, you know, was very like, um, like, wow, he's so unafraid to be who he is. Mm -hmm. He's just like, there's, he's stripping it all away through his poetry. I am not trying to fit into a box for you to make my poems work for you. I am, um, I'm here. This is who I am. Deal with it. Mm. Um, and I think that related to that, Natalie Goldberg, Writing Down the Bones was a huge book because, and that's a book that, you know, she was very influenced by beat poetry. Um, I think she went to Naropa, um, which is in Boulder, which is the school for disembodied poetics that was started by Jack mm -hmm. Kerouac, which is the best name for a poetry school ever. <laughs> um, and, and that was kind of her gig too, which is like the writing process should be transformative for you as the writer at the same time that it provides something transformational for the reader. And it is this playground for you to explore who you are and to strip it away. Because if you can put it down in words, like the truth of who you really are, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's very freeing. It's mm. very freeing. Hmm. Yeah. I've always been a, a little bit envious of people that that got into poetry young, like you did, because I always thought it was like silly and, you know, who would want to, you know, and now like I'm, for example, I've been trying to like get into um, some more Shakespeare and stuff too, because it's, you know, I feel like one should, you know what I mean? And I, Cause I never got it when I was younger. So um, I feel like if you can click with that stuff with words early on, I think it's such an advantage later on. Um, so it's, it's cool that you, you actually at 14, you're already reading these kinds of things. Um, but you had mentioned, um, your de your parents and that, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about them. You mentioned that both your parents worked jobs that they resented a little bit just to kind of put food mm -hmm. on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're both retired now. So luckily I don't have to like cover it over just in case their boss somehow <laughs> ever heard this, but yeah, um, <laughs> You know, my mom worked not as a lawyer, but for a law firm doing some administrative kinds of things. And uh, my dad worked for the security um, for a bank. So like the people who are behind the cameras watching, um, you know, if an alarm gets pulled, the first people who are supposed to respond. Um, and uh, after they divorced, the custody arrangement was set up in such a way that m basically Monday through Thursday, my sister and I were with my dad. Um, I have two younger siblings, but one is a, a half sibling with f my mom. Um, so my, sis my, my sister and I, who are both from the same father, Monday through Thursday, basically, we'd go to school and come home and be with our dad. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday would be with our mom. Um, so my mom worked a Monday through Friday schedule, um, for this law firm. And my dad then worked the weekends and got 40 hours in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to get all of those hours in to be able to be with us during the week. Wow. But of course that also meant that he was extremely tired during the week and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it was, it was great that he was available, but yeah, those were the things that he did and, um, shifts could get cut. Money could be scarce. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, you know, I know that before he retired, the bank where he worked, my father was observing that, um, in his opinion, there were people that the, at the, in management who were trying to get the people who had been around longest to hate working there, like being unkind to them, <laughs> adjusting their time cards, trying to do things to get them to quit because, when you had that much seniority, you had to pay more per hour and they could get someone new in for a fraction of the cost. Mm. Um, so my dad put up with a lot of, I think, unfair treatment from that bank. Um, you know, and I know that for years he hung in there to, to be there because he had the promise of a pension and he was just like, I just got to hang in there cause I'll get a pension. Mm. And then they took pensions away. I mean, it's oh. all kinds of stuff that they would do, um, routinely. And I think that, you know, to say what I learned from that, um, it was kind of a dual message because both, both my parents were, I think because of the fear they felt around money, they were very like, you have to go to college. You have to like get a career that'll pay your bills. Um, 
and and I, I, I if I had told them at 18, oh, someday I'm going to be self-employed, they probably, I'm sure they would have been like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> um, you know, because they both had had that experience. You know, they also, you know, like my mom was pregnant at 18, you yeah. know, it's with me. Um, I, I have had the luxury of not having a child till I'm 34. You know, mm. that's, that's a lot of like life and living and getting a foundation under yourself that I had that advantage of, of being able to do. Um, but yeah, no, they didn't like their work. Um, and I would say that I found it really motivating as a teenager and into my twenties you know, how can I live life on my own terms? Because I re I, I've always hated restriction. I've always mm -hmm. actually really been very anti-authoritarian and really not liked restriction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds very similar to me. <laughs> <actually>. <laughs> um, it's, it's quite amazing, isn't it? How many people kind of go through life really disliking their jobs and never doing anything about it. And it's not always because they you know, they, they don't want to, it's just sometimes because they can't, you know, and they want, they, right. they need to make certain sacrifices to say, support their family, whatever the story is. But, but I guess it is kind of sad, like, you know, and this is a lot about, I guess, what you do now as well, you know, that, that people will go through life and not, not uh, make it on their own terms, you know, and uh, look back are probably with a bit of regret. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, with, it's so hard because, um, you know, what is that line between, you know, I, I would never want to sound like just some privileged idiot going, you can do anything you want and, um, and speak from that place of privilege without acknowledging the very real economic realities that, that people face. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the United States, where, as we all know, healthcare is not a given, um, you know, and, and, um, economic disparity is, I think they're, they're saying now that it's the widest it's ever been between the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich. And I don't think that's just in the United States, but it certainly is, you know, it's my lens. Um, and at the same time, I think that, you know, even in the days when I did work a job where it wasn't my greatest passion, but it was like, this is what's going to pay the bills. Building my business on the side was, kind of that nod to the fact that it was like, okay, I mean, I even remember thinking about it this way, like, okay, this is like the bank account that I'm investing in for someday. Like, mm -hmm. no, I'm not making enough money to support myself when I first start out as a life coach, like nowhere near that. But if I continue to invest in this as some kind of a backup plan, somehow, some way it will pay off. The very worst I'll be able to, to say is that I might have had a job that I didn't like to pay the bills, but I also tried to make this dream, this other yeah. thing that I loved work. And so usually that's the the perspective that I encourage people to take whenever it's like, okay, I, I really want to do something different, but I have these other economic realities. And then, I mean, the other piece, I guess, too, is that with, with a salary job, it's, it's um, if you don't like it, it's that question of, well, what are you willing to let go of? in, you know, in sacrifice to your dream. Cause if you're spending $5 on a latte every day on your way to work and that's five days a week, that's $25 a week. And that's a hundred dollars a month and a hundred dollars a month times 12 months is $1,200. You know, it's like these things add up. And so what do you want to invest in? You know, what's mo most important to you? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, that that's another piece of it too. Exactly. But I wouldn't want to say that without having some some clarity around my empathy for the fact that financial struggles or being in a job you hate, but you have to stay for the health insurance or for for some other reason. That's a really real thing, and it's hard. Yeah, yeah, definitely, very, very hard for sure. Yeah, I guess it's a, like each individual case is definitely different. Um, so just going back to your story, like uh, you mentioned that your dad and you mentioned the Midwest and have been super hot. One of the things that you, that you wrote about was uh, your dad used to let you stay up till like 2 a.m. in the morning and you guys would play like all these different games and stuff. So, because <laughs> it was too hot to sleep, basically. Yes. Yes. I mean, now that I'm a parent, I'm kind of like, eh. I don't know that that was accurate. I mean, like you, kids are kids, they fall asleep, da, da, da. but, but yeah, yeah. My dad's house would be staying up until 
two in the morning. Um, it wasn't the most functional parenting move. Um, but yeah, shoots and ladders and, uh, you know, checkers and connect four and twister and, you know, playing piano or reading books or, you know, or, you know, catching fireflies in jars, you know, all, cool. all that stuff was, was part of my childhood. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real thing. Catching fireflies in a jar. I don't know. I've always, you see it on the movies and stuff. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like an actual, I mean, they don't bite you, you know, they, they kind of tickle <laughs> when they crawl, but I, I think that's one of the most beautiful things um, about, you know, growing up in the Midwest, there, there are two things I miss now living in California is, is in the Midwest that smell right before a thunderstorm because California doesn't have usually the weather conditions to create thunderstorms. So I miss mm. them. Hmm. Um, yeah. And then also things like fireflies, you know, cause it's, we just don't have them here, you That's know? Awesome. Um, but yeah, those were, um, and, and, you know, like having that, that, you know, that kind of leniency, there was, there was something about that that communicated a sense of, I, I don't know, with my dad, I always felt like he had a, a sense that I was basically good, didn't need a lot of controlling and would kind of figure it out. And that's good and it's bad, you know, on the, on the good side, I think it, again, the independence, the kind of like you do you, like, I don't need to like try to orchestrate your whole childhood here. Um, on the bad side, sometimes getting older and, and being put in charge of making adult decisions and, um, and, and that not always being the most helpful thing. Yeah. hundred percent. You, you mentioned, you know, making adult decisions and that kind of thing. And um, at one stage, um, you, you remember g being given $20 by your dad to, to buy groceries for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he didn't give them to me, but um, we went to the grocery store and he turned to me and he just said, so I have $20 for, you know, us to get groceries for the next two weeks. We help me pick stuff out. And at the time, I, I thought I was so brilliant because I figured out, oh, like get a box of pancake mix because pancake mix, you just have to add water. Um, <laughs> you don't have to add anything else. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I didn't know what I was sort of participating in at the time. And so we bring this box of pancake mix home and like literally for two weeks, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we ate wow. pancakes. That is what we <laughs> ate for two weeks. And um, for years after that, I would not eat, I wouldn't eat pancakes. They would make me physically nauseous if someone, you know, if anybody was like, let's go out for a pancake breakfast, I'd be like, oh, no thanks, oh. you know. <laughs> um, maybe that was his master plan. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I just know that, you know, when I got to college, um, it's pretty common for college students to maybe go out late dancing and then go to like a greasy spoon kind of diner, like a Denny's. Mm -hmm. Um, to get pancakes after kind of a wild night before you, you know, head home. And I just mm. remember sitting in booths in Denny's in college, just like, oh, no. And then uh, <laughs> sometime around uh, graduate school, um, I don't know, things just seemed different or whatever. And I, I, I was able to eat pancakes again. And um, I mean, a lot of, you know, there were some really ser serious financially difficult times in those years. Um, my father, for a family of three, the year that I was a freshman in college, um, only made $17,000 for a family of three, which like, wow. you know, um, in case anybody's listening to this and they're like, oh, but inflation, it's like, no, 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 no. even at the time, $17,000 was not a lot of money for a family of three. Hmm. Wow. And um, I remember my sister calling me when I was, I went away to college and my uh, on scholarship, which is part of how I afforded college. Um, and I went away to college. And I remember my sister uh, emailing me or calling me during my freshman year and there, the refrigerator at home had broken. And so to save all the food, it was during the winter and they, you know, my sister and my father took all of the food out of the freezer and went and set it on the front porch because it was below freezing. <laughs> so wow. the food would not go bad sitting out on the front porch. <laughs> like, I mean, but this was just kind of like, it sounds really chaotic and crazy. And like, how does anybody deal with that? But it's like, this is, this is what 
working poor people are dealing with every single day, mm. all the time. Mm. Um, and, and even today there's a, you know, I feel both, um, really grateful. F I, I know I keep saying grateful and that feels really, really resonant. Like how could you be, but, but yeah, really grateful. Like that experience made me hungry. Those experiences made me not just physically hungry, but literally like mm. it is on me. I am, I, 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 I don't have the time to sit around doing keg stands in college. I need to get an actual education here because if I don't get the grades, I'm not going to be able to make money. I'm not going to be able to do anything. Um, I went to a college that is um, a very rich college in a very rich area. And again, like I said, on scholarship and a lot of the kids that I went with are, were like trust fund kids who, um, whose parents were probably on the board you know, donating money to thank you, pay for my scholarship. Mm. Um, but they were pulling up in Maseratis to go to class and wow. I had a beater car, you know. Um, I knew that I, that the stakes were higher for me, that there weren't as many, there wasn't as much room for slip ups. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, sounds like you're like really sort of headstrong and wise for such a young lady, but, but you actually wrote, uh, write about growing up. You felt a confusing mix of being mm -hmm. both highly sensitive and wildly tenacious, extremely introverted and also like ferociously opinionated. Um, so you sometimes felt isolated and out of place in social groups. Um, yeah. yeah why, why was that though? That I felt isolated or that I was the confusing mix? Well, I guess, yeah, I guess both <laughs> of them. <laughs> I mean, the confusing mix is maybe like m more obvious because I think a lot of us maybe do feel like we're, we're very sort of a broad mix of, of personalities or, or emotions and stuff. But yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe you do know why you were a bit of a mix of that and feeling isolated. Yeah. Um, Ooh, I, I, there was just a lot of feeling like getting a message about being too much, you know? Um, so the sensitivity was like, it would show up as um, just feeling like really devastated if someone didn't want to play with me, you know, really devastated if there was like a, a, a problem in a friendship, really had a hard time receiving criticism from my parents, from a teacher, you know, really wanted to sort of do it right to stay emotionally safe, to not have a verbal takedown on my character. I found that very difficult. I still find that very difficult. Um, if it's someone I know, you know, if it's someone I don't know, if it's just like an internet troll, it's a little bit like, eh, you know, what are you doing? You're hanging out on the internet, putting people down. But if it's someone I know, even when I know that their behavior is out of integrity, like I, I had a friendship breakup this past year or within the past year. And even though I knew that like her behavior was out of integrity and that I deserved something better, it was still this feeling of like, but I don't want you to be mad at me. I, it, mm -hmm. Maybe there's some way I could fix it that you wouldn't be mad at me. Or maybe there's, you know, and, and I can recognize, you know, with, with age, I can recognize that, that that wasn't, that that's not healthy. But as a kid, it felt like my whole world was crushing down if the other girls didn't like me. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, so then, then there's too much or too sensitive. You should like be able to roll with that more. You know, there was, mm -hmm. there was those kinds of messages, but it was also, I was really opinionated and really like, I wanted to learn. And I went to these schools that were pretty shitty you know, I, I went to schools in a really poor neighborhood. They were underfunded. They had teachers who weren't experienced. They had teachers who were not kind, who, um, you know, sometimes would directly put me down and other kids down too, right? You know, mm -hmm. this is just the whole system. And sometimes I, I was caught in this place of like, I wanted to play the game and really please the teacher. And then other times it was this, the tenacity, the kind of like, how dare you? I know you're shortchanging my education. I know that you're not actually giving any of us, you know, I know you're not speaking respectfully to us. And I think also maybe I was just kind of a weird kid. I remember 
And every therapist I've ever had has told me this. You, yeah, you're a weird duck for this. I remember um, thinking, seeing my parents argue before their divorce and thinking to them, to myself, well, why are you guys talking that way to each other? But if I talk that way to my sister, I'm in trouble. Like I could see the hypocrisy. Mm. And I remember looking at them at one point and actually having the thought go through my head at like seven or eight years old. They don't know what they're doing. (laughs) <laughs> like, like most kids don't do that. Most kids are like, your parents rule the world. They make the rules. They da da da. I, I, so I don't totally know why I would be different in that way, but, but I do remember being that way. And then there's this whole piece of trying not to let anyone see it because I knew it was weird. You know, um, I, I there were just all kind. I was always coming up with projects and business ideas and, stories. I was writing books. I had like an old typewriter that I got from somewhere like antique. We're not electric, like with a ribbon. (laughs) I was sending my stories off to Scholastic and um, the publishers of the, you know, books that I was reading going, I'm Kate Swoboda and I'm seven years old and (laughs) I would like to write a book for you. And my parents, God love them. They didn't say, um, this is not how books get published. They just gave me the stamp and they let me send it off, which is awesome. Oh, that's that's so yeah, I was, a, I, was, I was a weird kid, I think. I mean, we're all kind of weird in our own way, but that was 100%. definitely weird in that way. Yeah. Well, so parts of that story are certainly not weird. I think, you know, like um, to, to feel rejected never feels nice, you know, and obviously everyone deals with it in different ways. Some people do have thicker skins, but I agree with you. Like people can give sensitive people a hard time and, I think it's so important to give people the space to to deal with things the way they do. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I think, you know, as you get older, maybe you realize that your the, the, the self love is so important. You know what I mean? Like friendships, external validation is important, but I guess for me anyway, I feel like as I've gotten older, like that has to come from inside more and more because you are the person that has to make yourself feel better. And it, I mean, it certainly seems like, you know, you've come to that point, but you also mentioned like, uh, at, at high school and college, you also, because of, I suppose, some of these feelings, you felt a little bit depressed and, um, you suffered with sort of isolation off the back of that and, and even some eating disorders. Um, and I mean, on the extreme end, you even felt at, at times that you wish you, you go to sleep and not wake up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was more around, um, 14, 15, 16, which was, you know, probably the hardest time I, I can remember. Um, you know, I'd, I had a boyfriend when I was 14 for over a year. And when I went to, from middle school to high school, we broke up. And again, you know, like it's that thing of, of, you know, the relationships and wanting the connection. And then that jarred me. And then, um, you know, and I mean, it seems so almost silly to talk about now, but, but, you know, when you're at, when you're at the top in middle school, you're one of the older kids and you kind of know what you're doing and you've been, and then to be thrown into this environment as a freshman in high school, not really know um, who I was or what my place, it's a bigger arena. And, and that was when eating disorder was happening. um, Cutting was happening. Definitely suicidal, um, thoughts were, were pretty constant. And then things got a little bit better towards the end of high school, but I, the same thing in college. And one thing I, I think about in hindsight is that transitions were really hard and like how many of us don't really, like nobody really talks about what a transition is. It's, I mean, I, 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 it just seemed like the adults were just kind of like, okay, yeah, the next step is you just go to this grade or mm-hmm. this school or, you know, but I didn't really know. I, I don't know. It was like, I didn't know how to navigate a transition. Um, and, and then the lacking skill set, it would just always come back to me. Something about me is either too much or not enough. And because of that, I'm friendless. I don't know who I am. I don't like who I am. Um, and, and yeah, just always feeling that sense of I'm weird. I feel like I'm just weird and I don't know, I don't see anybody else who's quite like me. And, 
and and um, that could be a case of terminal uniqueness. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it, it definitely yeah it was it was not a fun period. It was not a fun period. Yeah. And what what is your relationship like with your mom at, at this sort of stage? Hmm. We are. Um, you know, I, today, today, no, I, or, no, or, or at, 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 yeah, high at school, that time, at oh, that time. fighting all the time, yeah, yeah. fighting oh, really? constantly. Yeah. 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 And my dad and my dad. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fighting, fighting constantly. Like yeah. just not, I don't, I just not able to navigate it all. My, my mother was getting into a new relationship around that time. Um, my father would have been starting to hit some of the hardest financial years. Um, and then, and then I think both of them actually, but particularly my mom, when I was in high school, was really worried that I, I could end up just like her, so to speak, 18, pregnant, you know, things like that. Because I, like I said, I had this, um, I had this boy, well, I had, I, I've kind of always had had boyfriends. And, you know, I think she was really worried that I was going to get pregnant and, you know, end up, end up getting stuck in some of the same stuff as her. But the vulnerability was not there to say, Hey, I love you. I'm worried you're going to get stuck in this. Here's what mm. happened to me. It was more like, I'm going to control, you know, you're a teenage girl and I'm going to put you on lockdown where I can. Mm. Yeah. You know, what's also fascinating Kate is off, off the back of what you were saying there. And, um, you know, Gareth and I have actually been speaking about it recently about the transition phases like this. And it's, it's quite fascinating. Like, it's weird how when you have growth phases in your life or, or transitions, you, it can be really tough times because you, you kind of one foot's here and one foot's there and you're not, people don't always give you the tools to, especially like you say, as a youngster to navigate that, that change. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and then, you know, now I'm a parent and my daughter just turned five and is about to start kindergarten and I'm feeling so um, protective of her in a transitional state. Um, you know, to the point where my husband and I were talking about summer and family wants to visit and when, and, um, the program that my daughter's starting for kindergarten is a year round school. So they start in the summer and just really going, I don't want people visiting in the week leading up to, or right after when she's making this transition and, um, just watching her, act out and, and be like, I don't like, I don't like my preschool when she's like kind of jetting out of preschool. And then also, you know, in tears the next moment, I'm not going to see my friends anymore. And, (laughs) and just really trying to hone my own ability to, to not just dismiss it and go, well, you'll you'll be fine. You'll meet new people and just really go, I know that's hard. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. And and do you think uh, being a mom has, changed like your view of your parents and your relationship with them at all? Well, I had done a lot of that work prior to becoming a parent. So like a lot of that had shifted, I don't think because of becoming a parent, but what I will say is that I think I had kind of hoped that becoming a parent, I would have that insight, kind of what you're alluding to of like, Mm. here's, what it really means to be a parent. And now I understand so many more things about what my parents were juggling. Um, But the honest truth is, especially the first year, there was almost kind of a grieving that I felt um, because I didn't understand more. If anything, I had a feeling of protection around this tiny little baby that I had and kind of had feelings of like, I, I find it harder to understand some of the choices that they made, you know, cause mm-hmm. I sit here and I go there. No, no, there's no way this tiny little kid who I just am like, it's, it's biological, the attachment, it's emotional. Mm-hmm. It's, it's everything. Like I can't, uh, you know, and, and it, you know, I understand logically that people don't know what they don't know and people do the best they can in every single moment, even when it doesn't look that way. That's what they're doing. And that's what I do know to be true. And it also was not this profound moment of reckoning. It was actually like, oh, okay, there's a little more pain in there that I get to go (laughs) to coaching (laughs) sessions and like sort out for myself because, 
because this feels really hard. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in tears. I'm thinking, how could you have, you know, the, the younger and less developed feelings are very, you know, kid feelings. Like, how could you have done that? That wasn't fair. Mm -hmm. And some of that came up for me after becoming a parent of like, how could you have done that? That wasn't fair. I was just a little tiny human being. How could you have been hard on me? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Wow. Totally get that. So, so, um, I guess now looking back on the, those times that you, that you were sort of depressed in high school and college, you, you feel that that was like more centered around feeling powerless, if I'm yes. right. Um, yes. And w- what was ultimately the thing that got you out of that feeling of being powerless and uh, being depressed? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, the biggest thing I think is really the relationship that I developed with my coach, Matthew Marzell. I mean, that's, that's really what I credit it with. I, I went to therapy, um, read self-help. Um, but the way that Matthew really works is this blend of empathy and you need to take responsibility for your life. And what I found often was that self-help kind of div- was, was of two different worlds. There's either total empathy. It's not your fault, just compassion. You've had hard things and that's fine. Except then I'd just be in this place of like, I know it was so hard for me, but -hmm. without the like action oriented place, which is the other piece of self-help, which is you need to take responsibility for your life. That was what happened to you. Then this is who you are now. And you're not a kid anymore. And you don't live in your parents' home and you don't live in that neighborhood and you don't go to those schools and you aren't at the mercy of those friends. Like you're curating your life. So act like it. Mm -hmm. And in the other thing that would happen is, you know, in self-help, there's usually people, if they're in that space, they're totally in that space. And that's like the Tony Robbins shoulder pads and like, (laughs) you know, take charge of your life. Mm -hmm. What worked for me was a mix of the two. So Mm -hmm. I needed someone who was very like, I totally get it. That was so painful. Now, what do you want to do with it? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it, it had to be the blend of the two. And with him, the work was, um, you know, I think I, I went into, you know, I think I only went into it because I, I met the man who is now my husband, Andy. Um, and at the time, uh, we'd only been dating for about a year and a half. And my husband does men's work. And uh, Andy and I had been arguing a lot. And uh, he started talking to some of the people on his men's team. And they all were like, you got to go see this guy, Matthew Marzell. He's this amazing couple's counselor. He's so good. He's so good. He's helped my marriage. And when my husband initially, then boyfriend initially approached me about going to couples counseling, I was like, so in my shame about it that I couldn't even be receptive. I was like, Oh my God, this guy, like couples counseling in my mind at the time, that was what you did when someone cheated and you were trying to save the marriage. It wasn't like what you did just because you were arguing. Yeah. So we started going to couple sessions with Matthew and that was enormously helpful. But of course, what started to emerge is that I had a lot of personal work that I needed to do. Hmm. And so I started having one-on-ones with him as well. And that to me marked a real turning point because I was going to lose my relationship if I didn't change. I was angry. I was taking out my anger on, on him and other people. I was ashamed of my anger. So then I was also kind of depressed about how angry I was and ashamed of how I was treating him. Um, He has his own patterns too, you know, but um, for my part, if I own my part, that was my part. And um, yeah, I I just knew I couldn't live with the idea of losing Andy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how you say you have to, you have to put in some work, you know, and it's, but also still meet people where they're at. Um, yes. I think it's such a, such a great bit of advice because we're very quick to judge others, but you know, the people's situations are their situation. It's real to very, very real to them in the, in that place. So always got to try and understand um, when someone's going through something to, to be supportive first. And, but then like you say, taking action is ultimately what happened, but you also did, how did you come to sort of, doing more journaling and writing and, and getting to that side of things. Was that through the coaching or did you, was that just something you'd always done and it kind of turned into like a therapy for you? 
Yeah, it always it been what I'd always done. You know, the when I was growing up, when there were secrets, when there were things about myself that I didn't think I could talk about with anybody else, you know, always been writing, have my first diaries from a really young age, you know, I'm always a diarist. Um, but then the the work work that w that that shifted things with Matthew was, you know, he has this whole set of like these are the tools that you need to be practicing daily. And they were things like an integrity check-in, uh, you know, gratitude, self-appreciation, um, you know, different things like that. And I literally made a grid in the back of one of my moleskin notebooks. I'm a, I'm a huge moleskin notebook fan. You know, they're the ones that have the, this is like 2019 <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> And I made like a little grid in the back of my moleskin. It's not in this one, but you know, I'd take these lines and I'd like put, you know, lines here. And then these were the days of the month along the top. And I would do a little X and um, I, I was like, I have to be accountable about this. Cause I, I really saw how the, the anger that I was feeling in the arguments that I was having was just like so toxic. It was just, it was just, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard as a woman because of the things that get put on women when they admit to their anger to even, even be like, yeah, I was an angry woman. I was like a really angry, out of control anger kind of thing. And I think that it was, um, it took really getting to that point of going like, I have to make an X on in the back of a notebook every day to <laughs> keep myself accountable. Um, I think there are some parallels there to like 12 step work, you know, mm -hmm. people who do 12 step work, it's like, you have to, you know, it works. If you work it, you have to work the yeah. tools every day. You don't get a day off from working those tools. And when you actually embrace the work, you don't want a day off mm -hmm. because it's like food. It's like nourishment. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's such a, like a great habit to have in general in life, like in, in business in, in whatever it is, is to, is to have that discipline and to have that consistency to do things day in and day out, you know, especially if you want to like be successful and be in control of your own life, like you have to do those things. They sort of like, you know, you, you can't not do it. You can't not, you can't do it like, okay, I'll do it today. And then maybe I'll do it next week and whatever. Um, if you, yeah, if you just do want to have like, you know, control of your own life. Yeah, I think consistency reaps far more far more benefits in people's lives than um, high effort here and there. Like, like, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, I, I see that in. I mean, I guess an, a, another related thing that kind of went into that was I, I had the fortune of starting piano lessons through a local community center when I was younger. And when you learn music, you learn. Take, you know, there's this big piece of music, but to learn it, you have to take the little component parts and practice them a piece at, the at a time. And then you build some pieces from here and some pieces from there. You start to knit them together. And I, I think that, that music taught me that. And then, I mean, even later, like training for triathlon, it's like, you can't just go, oh, I'm going to do a half Ironman next month. You know, it's like, no, you have to like plan six months at least in advance and then work backward and go, what are the little things I'm going to do that are going to add up over time so that six months or a year from now, I'll be able to do this like crazy triathlon thing. And I, I just, that's what I see more than anything is that people want to eat well for one day and, or three days out of the week, but not four you know, the other, not the other four and then go, well, well why don't I have good health? And it's kind of like mm -hmm. a total empathy for, for how we use food to self-medicate and how hard it is to face the things that cause us to self-medicate right beside, what do you mean? Why don't you have the health yeah. you want? Because three <laughs> days a week you're, you're eating well, but the other four you're not, you know, and that's just, you know, you're in a body and it has physical limits and you, you just can't do that. If you want to have great health, same thing with a relationship, you know, you mm. can't have awful arguments with your partner several times a week and then be really nice the other days and expect that the arguments don't cause scar tissue. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's kind of almost logical, isn't it? Like you just, it makes so much sense when you say it like that. And, and I think, look, sometimes people scoff at the idea of morning routines and stuff, but 
I think that's exactly why it's so important is because it's something every day, even if it's a little bit that can help build onto something big. And, and, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, sustained daily effort, but, um, and ultimately you saw a lot of your stress in that disappear and improve as, as you mentioned. Um, but what other, were there any other sort of particular things that you'd learned um, as a result of some of that writing and the healing work that you were doing? Hmm. Well, I don't know as a result of the writing. I mean, I'm in the San Francisco Bay area. I've done a lot of stuff. Like, you know, I, I went to, I was asked to speak at a conference in late 2018 and I inserted into the, jo into the, you know, the talk, you know, you can't swing a purse without running into somebody who's coming back from their latest, you know, naked body acceptance workshop and everybody kind of giggles. And I'm like, I've only done two. And then everybody's like, <laughs> you know, because I have, I've done two, you know, like I, I, you know, the gamut of stuff that's out there, um, to really shift your life. I, I've tried a lot of it. Um, and I, and I think that the writing is always, I think the writing is the thing I was born for, you know? I mean, I just, you know, I, I say on my, uh, my about page, I just changed in the last couple months. And I was like, what's the most honest thing I could say about writing? And it was, I've always wanted to make slow, steady love with words. Like, mm -hmm. That's like my favorite. It's my favorite thing about reading. It's my favorite thing about writing. It's actually my favorite thing about coaching too. When somebody who is suffering finds the words to articulate just how it felt, there's something so powerful about finding just the right word that feels real. And I think what we're all sort of stumbling towards is an experience of being human where we want who we truly are on the inside to be how we actually live on the outside. Mm -hmm. And that's a guiding force that comes from writing. I think, I think when you write and you commit to the page, things that are really true about who you are, that's the first little leak that it gets to, from being bottled up inside of you out into the wider world because someone could find the thing you wrote. So maybe you aren't putting it on a blog post yet, or maybe you're not on a podcast broadcasting to the internet about it, but it's like that first little place where you get to tell the truth. And I think it's so powerful. Yeah. yeah. Massively. Yeah. Like um, one of the things which I started a few months ago was morning notes mm -hmm. and wow, it's just amazing what sort of comes out of that. You know, you just kind of sit down first thing in the morning and you start writing and I think it's three pages that you mean to write. And uh, it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's kind of liberating in a way as well. And there's stuff that's bubbling up underneath there and in your head that just sort of comes out and it just kind of frees you and makes you feel good and um, just makes you more aware of, I guess, you know, who you are in, in a way. Yeah. Is that from morning pages from the artist's way? Sorry, morning pages. Sorry, not morning notes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. Notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of things I tried, I did that in college. Used to do that. Yeah. did that for years <laughs> in college. Yeah. I mean, Julia Cameron, the artist way. That's a great book. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so just going back uh, to your story a little bit, you, you basically graduated uh, with uh, $26,000 in loans. <laughs> like a, yes. A lot of Americans do. It's crazy how much you guys sort of um, accumulate in terms of your loans. Um, but you then started working as a professor um, in San yes. Francisco. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And an adjunct professor. Cool. Yeah. And what, 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 did, what did it entail exactly? I was an English professor. Um, so I, and, and I was an adjunct, which meant that I, I hadn't been, I wasn't on, um, there's tenure track, which means not, not tenure, but tenure, T-E-N-U-R-E. -E. Okay. Yeah. Um, and once you get a tenured position, you are like a permanent member of the faculty. Um, I was an adjunct, which meant that I taught for several schools part-time because to cobble together full-time hours. Um, and so I, you know, just kind of was contracted semester to semester. And then, I mean, the more, the longer you teach, the more seniority you have. So the longer I was there, the more it was like, oh, you're the first one we're going to offer classes to because you've been here longer. Um, 
So what that looked like was um, I did have like a, an outline from the department of the topics I was supposed to cover, but I could choose my own books. Cool. I could choose my own lessons, what I would lecture about, the homework, the format, curriculum design, basically. Hmm. So I started to um, attend curriculum meetings to learn how to write curriculum. I, I was really interested in um, metacognitive and reflective teaching. Hmm. Um, metacognition is thinking about your thinking or thinking about how you approach thinking, which is like really <laughs> weird, but makes sense. Um, trying to learn about, uh, you know, the biggest problem I had when I first started is that I was 22 and I looked like I was 22. So I had a lot of <laughs> discipline issues in the classroom that I didn't know how to confront because I, I, and I looked young for my age too. Um, I always tell people, I still remember the moment of my very first ever class where I, you know, inside I'm totally shaking and I've like wow. just purchased a suit the weekend before to try to look, you know, <laughs> sit up taller and all that. And I remember standing in front of the class and saying to them, everyone take out your notebooks and your pens. I'm going to give you a couple of notes to take. And I turn around to the chalkboard to write my name and, you know, a couple of things on the board. And I could hear them behind me taking out their notebooks and like in my, you know, my heart is racing. I'm like, oh my God, they're doing what I told them to do. You know, total like, <laughs> I don't know how obvious it was to any of them that I was just completely like freaking out. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, and then there was, it was trying to teach essay writing skills. And in San Francisco, there is a huge problem with, um, you know, the quality of schools within San Francisco. And there are a lot of students who can't get into university level English courses because they never had a great hmm. writing education leading up to it. So I was teaching some what's called transfer level courses. So people who were totally on track with where they needed to be and they just needed to get some credit hours at the community college and then move to a university. But a majority of what I was teaching actually were remedial sorts of skills, you know, um, how, and literally getting, sometimes it was English as a second language. Sometimes it was not having a great education, but, but literally like teaching that phonetically PH makes the F sound in the word phone, um, at the college level. So, you know, th there was a lot of emotion that was coming up with it. And what I found was that I, I, yeah, I hated the paper grading. Oh my God. Like, please, can I never grade papers again <laughs> in my life? Especially not like 120 of them due back oh to God. students over a weekend. That, that almost killed me. Um, but what I loved the most was actually office hours when students would come and they'd, they'd be like, I am totally stuck about how to write this essay. And I feel like everything I'm doing sucks. And it's like, yeah, I could talk to them about thesis statements and topic sentences, but what I really wanted to talk to them about was what's going on in your life? Mm. You know, how can I help? You know, do you want to, do you want to walk and get a cup of coffee with me while we talk about your essay? Like maybe they just need like a little, you know, point of contact. Um, that got hard though too, because then you get students who would take advantage of that and expect to get an A just because they were my buddy. You get <laughs> yeah. students who um, they didn't expect to get an A because they were my buddy, but it was it felt so hard to not give a passing grade according to the the like dictates of the department when I really liked someone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so so those were the challenges. Um, there were department politics. Um, I was a younger member of the department. I had some ideas about integrating digital learning. I, you know, had a senior member of the department who got up in my face one day and like told me off in front of everyone and, and was saying to me, that's ridiculous. You can't teach reading on a computer, which <laughs> is not actually true. And she had no idea what I was talking about, but, um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I've always thought marking papers must be devastating. Like just, you know, you really must put so much energy into it because you, you, you interpreting what they're saying. You have to read horrible handwriting. 
um, you know, like it just must be <laughs> pretty devastating. So that's character building in and of itself, I reckon. But yeah, um, <laughs> it's something. <laughs> yeah, it's something. <laughs> um, the, the first sort of inklings of of life coaching was happening, I guess, by the sounds of it at that stage too. And so you actually started to work, work as a life coach sort of on the side. And yeah. how did you manage the two? Well, the, the professorial schedule is actually pretty conducive because I, you know, and I'd been there for a couple of years. So I started requesting my own, uh, you know, my preferred schedule, which was to do night classes. And the other professors, for the most part, they didn't want night classes. They just wanted kind of like a nine to five gig. I was like, night class is cool. So, you know, the options were you could teach like a nine to 10 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which would mean three different trips in to teach those classes. Or I could teach a once a week, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's three hours as well, but it's just in one chunk. And um, so so that was that was what I did is I got my schedule down to two nights a week, because, but I got all my hours in teaching those two nights a week. And it was hard because I would get home at, you know, 11, 11.30 at night after conferencing with students after class because that was the only time they could meet and then it would take a little time to wind down and and like try to get tired and um Mm. you know the next day I'd be pretty tired but it it was what I had to make do and there were little hacks I learned along the way to try to make my time more effective and I definitely once I started working for myself I had to get better about boundaries and not volunteering for every committee and um that came with something of a price among colleagues of mine who had depended on me to be someone who showed up for those things. Um, But it was, it was just what I had to do to make the two work because it just, it wasn't going to work any other way. And the other thing too, that started to happen was that um, the college where I was teaching started to it was such an unfair such political situation in San Francisco. You know, it was observed that a lot of students who were coming into the college were being put into these like remedial tracks for math and for English. And someone or an organization, I'm not totally sure how it started, but basically they started to go, well, hold on a second. What's wrong with this college that you can't seem to graduate? people and that you're starting so many people on a remedial track. Are you taking advantage of these students by placing them in a lower track so it'll take them longer to get through so you can make more money off of them? Mm. And I have to say, from the perspective of someone in the department who taught, that is not at all what was happening. Like Mm. literally, when you are having to explain to people who are 22, 23 years old that PH makes the F sound in the word phone, they are not ready to write essays yet. They Mm. do belong in that remedial track. But the politics being what they are, the college became came under investigation and at one point was experiencing so many budgetary issues that they almost went bankrupt, almost lost their accreditation. Um, all those tenured faculty who thought they were guaranteed jobs forever almost lost their jobs. Thank God hmm. they didn't. Hmm. But uh, it, it also was like a clear thing to me of like, oh, I, this is, I don't want to just bank on this, you know, yeah. have something else that I want to do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's sad that, uh, that the government selected that. Um, but also the interesting thing and, and the thing which I think is a great lesson is if you do want to do your own thing, eventually it requires hard work, you know, yeah. and if that means, <laughs> you know, you have to work late at night, um, or you have to work on the side or work on weekends. That's actually what it takes if you want to do something for yourself. And um, it's not always going to be like that, but you know, in the early stages, it's definitely going to be like that. And you you have to, you have to put in the hard work if you want to get what you want. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And I, yeah, I saw at the college level, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people who didn't necessarily have that as a skill set. And sometimes I, I worry about the world that my daughter's growing up into, because when somebody would say, I don't have the money for books, but I'm looking at them and I'm like, that iPhone that's brand new that I've had to tell you to put away three times, like, it seems like you have money for that. And your mm-hmm. hair's different than last week. And I've noticed your nails have been done. So like, what's, what's the... It's like, oh, and it's such a complicated place to be because I don't want to be the bitch who's monitoring someone else's situation and I don't know. And, Mm. you know, 
who knows how that person's being provided for. And there's a part of me that just goes, well, all right, you can't afford the book. I put the book on reserve in the library. When did, why didn't you go to the library? Why are you making excuses? Yeah, but it, yeah. it's a hard thing. And um, bless the teachers who stay in it. I It was not for me to continually be both trying to motivate people to do something that they didn't always want to do and also be blamed when they weren't making the mark. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if people weren't passing, there was a kind of, well, what are you doing that people aren't passing? And it's like, it's so much more complicated than that. It's so much more complicated than the four months I happened to work with this person in the context of the totality of their entire life. Yeah. And there's yeah. just only so much you can do. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Being a teacher is such a difficult job and definitely yes. one that is not um, financially rewarded enough. I, I, I always... No. I always think that if I was like president of a country, uh, that would be teachers would be like one of the highest paid uh, nurses as well. Just, you know, just the wrong people these days and or, or, or the, 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 the people that need to pay, be paid these days are not paid well enough, which is, which is kind of sad. Um, yeah. But hopefully that'll change over time. You never know. Um, anyway, back in there. So in 2010, you decided to go coaching full time. Um, which I can imagine was a great feeling, but also probably, you know, a, a tough one because it was going, it was that transitionary sort of period that you would have to go through. But from, from what I've read, I think it was based off the back of a trip to your beloved Italy that basically <laughs> yes. changed yes. everything for you. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I, that was the time, that was the point when I really connected to the fact that courage had been behind anything good that had really happened in my life. Um, I went to Italy and I had this experience of, and and we should tell the story in a moment about how I tried to go coaching full-time for the first time in 2010 and fell on my face and had to go back to teaching, um, which we can do in a minute. (laughs) I don't recommend deciding I'm going to quit my job. You know, <laughs> as a as a strategy for business building, it's it's not one I recommend. Um, but I I went to Italy and I saved up, you know, on a teacher's salary. I was making about thirty five thousand dollars a year living in the Bay Area, where rent on my studio apartment was almost a thousand dollars a month. So imagine, wow. you know, thirty five thousand dollars a year, but then almost half of that's taken up with mm. rent. Mm. So good thing I grew up poor, so I know how to navigate that. Um, <laughs> So I go, I save up all my money to go to Italy, which at the time it was a huge risk because I made part of my salary by teaching summer school classes and I was not going to teach them in order to go away to Italy, which meant I had had to save up the income to pay for my home while I was in Italy because I couldn't give up my apartment just because I was in Italy, but I also had to pay for Italy and figure out how to make that work. Um, and I figured out how to make it work in two ways. Um, one was I, I stayed at relatively inexpensive places. I found a villa where they rented out rooms um, and it was outside of Florence. And then the other was that I thought, you know, I could expense this trip if I make it into a business related expense. And so I began pitching the local newspapers to say, can I write a travel piece for you guys on traveling through Italy? And I got picked up for two articles, one on uncommon European destinations and another on couch surfing. Cool. And I was traveling through Italy. And I mean, like I got to stay at these like gorgeous four-star hotels in Positano with like champagne on ice when I arrived because I got a media accommodation. It was completely free. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I looked at the like media PR thing after I left um, to stay at one particularly lavish hotel. And it was like one night was 1200 euro a night. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. Which at the time the EU had just made the change over to the Euro. Yeah. So, and, and I, you know, the, the dollar was like, it was $2 for one Euro almost. So it was like a dollar 75 for one Euro. Um, So in U.S. dollars, <laughs> it was insane. Um, but I get to stay there completely for free and like interview the owners about the property mm. for this article that I was writing. So, you know, that was like pretty awesome, right? Um, but then the other thing that happened that was like a real turning point was that I 
was on, you know, social media and I said something or other about how great Italy was and in what I call the universe's great gift to me, there was somebody who came along and kind of wet blanket and well, not everybody can just go off to Italy for the summer. And mm-hmm. it was such a great gift because the person who said it was somebody who I knew made twice as much money as me lived in a less expensive place than the San Francisco Bay area and was in a dual income household. Cause I was just wow. had my own income, but they had a partner as well. Plus they had paid vacation. I didn't have paid va- wow. vacation mm. and it's something clicked. And that's why I call it a gift. You know, this wet blanket. Well, not everybody can, do it. Mm. because she could have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> totally. and been paid th- for three weeks vacation to go to Italy um, and ha- made a lot more money. And, and it was like, Oh, oh, okay. I was willing to go without the lattes for six months. I was willing to not buy new clothes. I was willing to not have cable TV. I was willing to not, you know, have, you know, rent movies every single, I was ready to, willing to not go out to dinners in the United States randomly in order to be able to afford what felt like at the time, the trip of a lifetime. And I, it could have been a great risk and it could have been, um, Maybe I'd gone and maybe I would have hated it. Been the first person in the world to hate going to Italy and eating gelato. But um, it didn't happen that way, but it could have. And I was afraid to do it, but I was willing to lean into the discomfort of that. And that was when I actually made the connection like, oh, this is what courage actually is. This is it right here. This is what it looks like, you know? Wow. Amazing. And the courage to do the hard work. And like you say, and, and, it's also really courageous to say, I'm not going to do this and that. And, um, you know, and we should also just take a moment to acknowledge how amazing Positano is. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that the fact that you didn't mention the limoncello there, but that's okay. Well, that's for another podcast. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Florence actually has my heart. That's, that's oh, really yeah. the, the area. Rome is a little too chaotic for me. The yeah. coast is beautiful, but really expensive and yeah. super touristy. But Florence, I really like just loved it. Loved place. Florence. Yeah. 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 So, so you mentioned that you actually did a sort of um, not succeed, let's say, the first time that you, you sort of left. What actually happened there? Um, I saved up some money. And I, you know, I did this trip and I was like, I need to work for myself. This is the, you know, this is the time. And I I felt really buoyed by my courage to save up some more money and uh, took a leave of absence from my job intending for it to be a permanent leave of absence. And within a couple months, it was like, oh yeah, it wasn't, if you build it, they will come. You know, it was like, you have to, you have to have more than that. And I once heard an interview with Scott Belsky. Um, and he talked about the concept of you have to build yourself a runway. And when he said that, I really loved it. Cause I think with like any big dream, um, including like building a business, you know, when a plane takes off the physics of flight are that you need enough velocity or power, and you also need enough of a runway and you can't have like a long runway without enough power. You won't get off the ground and you also can't just have a lot of power but not a runway because the two actually have to work together. And I think the same thing is true about where I was in that place. It's like, I needed the, you know, I keep wanting to go like this. <laughs> um, I needed the, 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 the length of the runway is time and the velocity is the effort you're putting in the direction of your dream. And you've got to have that effort and you've got to put it over time. And you, you really just can't get one or the other. There are a lucky few who create something and it is immediately well received and goes viral and they never have to work a day in their life again. And we've all heard of those people, but really if you dig into their stories and you yeah. guys are in the business of this, so I bet you'll tell me it's true. What you find is that the, the supposed luck was, you know, 10 years of them doing something before they had a big break. So it might've come very fast when they had the big break, but actually the runway was building. Yeah. We, we can't uh, relate to that more. Like <laughs> we, we, we talk about this every single day about, you know, you just uh, have to be patient in everything that you do, you know, and, um, and that's what we constantly remind ourselves about, you know, about our, our podcast in particular is like, you know, we got to do the good work, be consistent with it, be patient, things will eventually happen. And, um, and the, the runway 
analogy is also really important, especially when it comes to finance, you know, like financially you have to give yourself a, mm-hmm. a good enough runways to, to um, deal with those lean times when you're not earning money as a, as a new entrepreneur, because yeah, it's not easy. It's not anywhere near as easy as you might think. Um, I always think that working a full-time job is actually a lot easier than, than working as an entrepreneur. Um, and it's funny before I actually did the switch myself, I thought it was the complete opposite. You know, I thought it was like, cool, you're an entrepreneur. It's like flexible and like all this sort of thing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but actually it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different ball game completely. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. No, but, but of course with it, you know, everything has like, you know, uh, say like good and bad and, and there's, there's, there's just so much other good stuff to it. So that's, mm. that's really cool. Um, but just, I guess, looking back now, like for yourself, you know, I guess in the last sort of nine years since you, you've, gone full time in your coaching you've achieved a hell of a lot in, in a fairly short space of time you know you, you started with your one-on-one coaching you've now developed a coaching program uh, you've become a mom uh, you've written a book and you like just in, you've inspired I guess thousands of other people how does it kind of make you feel when you when you look back on those sort of nine ten years now um hmm Well, it still feels funny to hear someone say you've done or succeeded or so much. You know, I don't, I don't sit around feeling like, oh, I've done so much. (laughs) It doesn't, (laughs) you know, it doesn't mean I'm not proud of the things I've done, but it just doesn't feel um, that way. Um, I've always been really impatient for the success if, if you really must know, I, I've always wanted it to have happened five years earlier than it actually mm-hmm. happened. I wanted a book 10 years ago, you know, I wanted, and I, I can look at the right timing, but even now today, the things that I want for myself and for my life are, are like, Oh, I want it now. Like universe, if you're listening, I'm calling it in now. Like, let's <laughs> do it now. Like I'm, I'm ready now. Like I, you know, and I think that, um, I think when I, when I look at the trajectory of it all, I guess where I go is if I could tell myself anything that, that some of that wanting it to happen right away is like, because maybe I was afraid that it wouldn't happen. So I wanted the proof to show up as quickly as possible that it was viable. And it's been a huge growth lesson in letting things unfold organically and in their right timing at the same time that I would want to tell that, that person that I was when I first started, like, like it's actually going to be okay. Maybe mm. don't quit your job yet. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> wait for that part. Um, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I guess it's a real, it's always like a bit of a tough one to balance understanding that things take a long time and you need patience and then balancing that with, knowing when to quit if it's not working uh, you know what i mean yeah. like yeah. i guess sometimes that that knowing straight away is is like you said that validation i'd never thought of it like that it's, it's such a great way but you know you just have to push through those times and and stick with your heart you know when you know what when you when you've been working so hard at something and you know it's coming um you've got to just have both but you know coming back to that courageousness that you 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 actually exhibit you're actually known as courageous kate and um, your superpower is certainly courage. And you've even uh, written a book called The Courage Habit, uh, yeah. which is a great book, by the way. So can you please take us maybe a little bit more into the four-part courage habit? Sure. Yeah. I, I use them all the time. Um, so the hypothesis of The Courage Habit, it's, it's all research-backed. It's all, you know, this is not me pulling this out of thin air and calling it mine. This is the result of, of I stand on the shoulders of so many people who have come before me and, and actually done clinical research into the psychology of courage, which I'm so geek. I, in my geekery, I'm just like, there, there's an actual psychology of courage. There are people who study the, the brain's psychological processes around courage. What? It's mind blowing. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> um, so great. Yeah, I love it. Um, the hypothesis of the book is that the fear based things that hold us back are actually fear based habits. And when we've been practicing something for so long, 
we take it on as an identity and we don't even realize that we're practicing something as a fear-based habit. We do things like go, oh yeah, I'm such a perfectionist. Oh yeah, classic people pleaser. You know, um, oh God, yeah, you know, self-sabotage, that's my thing. Or um, people tend to have a hardest time claiming the fear pattern of pessimism, but it's rampant. Oh, what's the point? Let's be realistic. So people don't even realize that what's happening in their brain, not, not like a conscious choice, but in their habit brain, they're feeling some kind of fear, like, you know, fear about traveling the world or starting a business or starting a podcast or whatever it would be. And then going into a fear-based routine. And it would be one of those routines, like I just mentioned, perfectionism, people-pleasing, pessimism, self-sabotage. And they do that because it's a comfort zone that gets them to a reward. And mm -hmm. people commonly go, well, what do you mean? What reward? You know, pessimism doesn't feel very fun. Ah, it's not fun. But in the short term, if you're facing the stress of like going after some big dream that you want, telling yourself a story of pessimism and it's not realistic keeps you in that comfort zone and decreases the intimidation and fear and, or sorry, habit formation is ruled by a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. That part of the brain does not want to feel stressed out. I'm, and if there are any brain surgeons listening to this, I always apologize. Like, I'm sorry. I, I know the brain is more complicated than what I'm talking about <laughs> right now. I promise <laughs> I get that. But, um, to, for the purposes of keeping it simple for the average person, you know, the, the brain does not like to be stressed out. The brain likes what it can anticipate, what it knows, predictability, regulation. So to step out of those fear-based habits takes conscious will. You have to actually look at the fear you're feeling and then decide to go into a different routine. And that's where the four parts of the courage habit come in. Access the body, listen without attachment, reframe limiting stories, reach out and create community. And the, the idea is that when you feel that fear, that intimidation, that stress, and you notice, oh, I'm going into a fear pattern. Let me interrupt that. Let me go try reaching out and creating community right now. Let me go try accessing the body right now, because that's going to get you to a longer term reward that that's actually what you want, which is the more emotional resilience, the ability to have the awkward conversation, say, I love you, go on the amazing trip, talk to the person who you're totally intimidated to interview and like, okay, I'm afraid I don't have to deny that experience, but like I'm developing more emotional resilience because I decided to bring in these courageous practices. Hmm. Hmm. Super cool. Um, what, what got you interested in like to actually research uh, courage and, and find out that, that people actually study this? <laughs> <laughs> well, being a total, a total dork. Um, and I, I'm proud of it. You know, I'm, I'm saying it a little bit, you know, um, condescendingly, I guess, about myself. But I, I actually like a uh, Google scholar. That's a riveting Friday night for me. <laughs> like, ooh, psychological <laughs> abstracts. What's been purchased? What's been published since 2019 started? Let's talk. Um, so I had actually a funny story. Great story. I got a book deal with a publisher based on a proposal that I wrote that was actually based on my digital program, the courageous living program. Cool. And so, uh, you know, I turned in my proposal, the book, the book proposal was sold, um, signed a contract. I had, you know, the chapters were due in chunks, this many by this date and this many by this date and this many by this date. And I started working on the initial chapters and something just kept feeling wrong or off. I don't know. Um, but I can tell when, when it's not flowing, when I'm writing mm -hmm. and, uh, somewhat as a procrastination move, I started going on to Google Scholar, like researching habit formation and psychological courage and emotional resilience and suddenly really realized like, oh, how habit formation works in the brain is actually how I've been working with clients for years. You know, I, I've had this model for courage of feel the fear because nobody gets out of that part. You, you dive in anyway, because that's how you lean in, even though you're afraid and you transform. And even if like leaning in, you just transform a little bit, like feel a little bit more capable because you leaned in, that counts. And so when I saw that the habit formation model was that you have a cue 
like fear and then you go into a routine and then you get a reward. It was like a eureka, like, oh, how we learn anything is based in habit formation and how we learn a skill set like courage is based in habits too. Um, so I turned in my proposal to my editor and I basically said, here's the thing, guys, if you want, I will totally turn in chapters that are what you expected because that's the proposal I sold you on. But I've got this other idea that I've come up with in the last <laughs> couple months since, since you agreed to pay me money for a book, <laughs> but I think it's better. You know, what do you think? And it was, I don't know. Have you seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind? Yes. With, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know how when they figure out that he's had a psychotic break and they break into his office and it's just like gibberish on the walls and red string? <laughs> yeah. I had this kind of like, what <laughs> if that's what's actually happening for me around this concept and my publisher's looking uh, at what I've turned in? Like, what is this? Who did this? Yeah. But luckily for me <laughs> and for them, they were like, yeah, this is really great. So publishing moves at a glacial pace. So this is all years ago. You know, the mm -hmm. book, you know, came out years after I signed the contract. So um, it was just like a deep dive from then on. It, it was just, you know, finding books and talking to people and getting the privilege of interviewing people. And um, yeah, so so that's that's the genesis of the whole story. It could have been your mm -hmm. kind of standard self-help book, but then <laughs> the medical geekery came out. Yeah, cool. I, I really love how you kind of linking mind and body, but in a sort of a very practical science-based way, you know, and, uh, and that's really great. Can, can you just maybe tell us a bit more about when you say reach out and create community and, and I suppose connection and that kind of thing, what does that mean? Yeah, so um, it can mean a lot of different things. Fear thrives in isolation. It diminishes in community. And really, you know, it's amazing the amount of research that's out there about how social connections impact everything from your mental health to how long you live. Like it's, it's so important. So reaching out and creating community, a lot of people have relationships of convenience. It's like I'm friends with her because our kids go to the same school. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily a relationship that's based in, rooted in two people having values that are tied to courage. And so what I am trying to talk to people about in, with that concept is how do you learn to recognize the signs that someone is kind of up to some of the same things as you in the world, like a bigger vision, things are possible, they're not very wet blankety, they, um, they want to do their work, they want to have, have their personal journey tied to a greater purpose. Um, because those are the people you want to connect with totally. actually. And so you got to learn how to recognize who they are. And then when you're really in it, those are the people you call because you know that even though you might want to look good to everybody and just kind of like hide out and like, Oh, things are fine. That's, that's, that's not true courage. You've got to lean in. So, you know, I mentioned earlier in our interview, I had had a friendship breakup and, mm -hmm. um, I was really sad about it. And, um, it was with a different woman. Uh, my best friend, Valerie, was not the person it was with, but Valerie was who I was thinking of calling. And mm -hmm. sitting on my couch, crying with my phone in my hand, like it was the hardest thing in the world to like send the text, can we talk? Like I'm, um, I'm, I'm, you know, ugly crying right now. Can we talk? Mm -hmm. It was 10 minutes before I could send that text, but uh -huh. I knew I needed to because mm -hmm. trying to deal with it alone was only going to increase the shame I felt or the sadness I felt. Um, and yeah, it was so great to talk to her about what was going on and just have someone, you know, go, Hey, you know, I, I'm really sorry this is happening. Not, not cause I can fix it, but I'm just sorry. And I love you mm. and you're going to be okay. Hmm. So yeah. important. Yeah. Super important. And, and what do you like, what do you say to people who, who might say to, you know, oh, I'm just not a courageous person. You know, I'm, I can imagine you might come up with that. Come up. Yeah. With, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, well, more often than that, I get people like, I don't let fear stop me. And I'm kind of like, mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> okay. you can't find one you can't find one place where fear stops you you are lying um <laughs> you know like people have you know total compassion for the fact that people feel compelled to lie about these things you know i get it because i've 
as I mentioned, been that performer who wanted everything to look good, but um, that ain't the doorway to freedom. Mm. Um, so nobody's born anything. You know, I wasn't born courageous either. This is a learned behavior. And yeah, there are probably some people who are born with a little more of the kind of daredevil in them, like just doesn't, don't really think five steps ahead to the could happens or the anxiety of what if I fail, but anybody can actually learn how to go, I'm going to think five steps ahead and, and I'm going to also deal with the anxiety of what if I fail. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really, it's a learning process. And the question is, what's the cost to you of not being willing to go? I want to change that. I want to change that about myself. If, if it's really what you believe that you're just not a courageous person as if it's a genetic default for you, then, um, you know, okay, if your life's working, great. You know, if your life is not working in some area, I think that's worth looking at. Mm, definitely. And look, we've only got uh, 12 more minutes of your time. So I just have, just have one more question kind of before we finish off. And, and it's something which really resonated with me about uh, what you're doing lately as part of your, your daily routine. I think it's really, really important for other people to grasp and to, if they can add to their, da their, their daily routine or morning routine. And yours is basically putting pleasure first. Yeah. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I, so it's before I start the work day yeah. is putting pleasure first. So um, I have found that when I try to uh, do the work first to get, oh, if I do all this work, I'll earn myself a little, little time to play, to knock mm. off. Now there's always another task, especially when you're an entrepreneur and just opening your email, you know, it's like, Oh, the fires to put out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I, I'm really like, okay, to honor my creative process, I've got to put pleasure first. And it's, it's not a seven days a week, um, rigidity kind of thing, but it is definitely, you know, for me, it's sitting right here on this couch over here. Um, I meditate, um, daily. Um, I do a practice I actually call on fire and on purpose. And then I write either in a journal moleskin or if something occurs to me that I'd like to write something structured about, like the start of a blog post, I'll just kind of start riffing and typing here are my ideas. And then I'll read. I mean, I've always got a million books sitting next to me at all times. Women Who Run With The Wolves, Clarissa Pinkola Estes, um, you know, lots of different, all kinds of, eh, you know, habit of breaking the habit of being yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Joe Dispenza. <laughs> um, over here, this one, because I'm building a bigger team, The Culture Code. Cool. Great book. And then, gosh, what else? Oh, Dare to Lead. So good. Brene Brown, you know. <laughs> so I've got my, you know, little little books and it's it's like a pretty dreamy situation to just you know like not have a commute and and it's like the first thing i get to attend to each day is my own mental process mm. yeah super powerful eh? super powerful yeah and it's yeah. You, you can't discount how much that can affect the rest of your day that that might be the only 10 or 15 minutes or half an hour that in your whole day that you actually have for yourself so if you're able to, how do you fit that in with having a, a little one? Like, I, like you say, is that part of the seven? It's not a rigid thing because sometimes I guess um, that could, you know, I don't, I don't know how that process or do you just try and fit it in any way around maybe wake up a bit earlier or whatever it may be? Yeah. You know, I call it a daily practice instead of a morning practice to give myself more of that room. Like, I mean, I nine times out of 10 do it in the morning, but um, yes. So I'll either wake up early um, to do it. I have to drop this product. Okay. I'm not an affiliate. The Philips Sunrise Alarm Clock yes. is ridiculously priced. $140 <laughs> for an alarm clock is ridiculous, but it, you, you sound like you know of this, of what I speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it <laughs> lights up the room like a sunrise, which you know, tells your body's biochemical processes, like, Hey, it's time to wake up. So, you know, you set that for like, you know, your 6am or whatever, if it's hard to get up and then it's, it's much easier to get up. It, 
might require a little negotiating if you have a partner, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I either get up before she does, or I, I just get up and have my morning with her and take, and my husband and he goes off to work. I, I you know, she goes off to school and that's when I have my time. So like that was today, actually, I mean, today was a whole, a whole other thing. Oh, um, <laughs> but you know, that, that's basically what I do. And then the, the practice that I do, uh, which, you know, I, I call it on fire and on purpose, you know, it, I think it has to be intentional. I've studied Zen Buddhist meditation, gone to monasteries. I can sit on a Zafu and stare at a wall and watch my breath. And that is very valuable. But the meditation practice I have now, I find most valuable and it's Insight Timer, which is a free app. Um, you can pay and get extra stuff, but it's a free app love listening to guided meditations and Sarah Blondin is my favorite. And it's just like something that sets my day. And then I have like, um, an upper limit meditation that I've recorded myself. Cause I know all of my upper limit stuff and, you know, I listen to that. Um, and then I'll check my, I use the daily greatness business planner. Um, again, I'm not affiliates for any of these. I just, when I have a tool that works really well for me, I like to share and I will sit and I'll check in um, the planner. You know, you do annual goals at the beginning and then quarterly goals. And then I use the quarterly goals to go, what am I going to focus on for this week? Oh, cool. Love it. Those are great <laughs> tools. So, you know, just before Gareth sort of gets to the last uh, question we have for you, uh, Kate, uh, we're just wondering sort of what you're planning at the moment and also where people can contact you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm planning to hang out with you guys and um, I'm working on my second book proposal Cool. and nice. um, bringing uh, coaching to corporate because I would really love it if so many people didn't hate their job. And I think if coaching was integrated with a lot of companies, mm. they would not hate their job so much. Mm. Um, working on also a program called Helping the Helpers. Um, I, and I, in fact, just talked to a friend of mine today who runs the organization Safe Place International. They go to areas where LGBTQIA communities are particularly persecuted, like refugee camps, where maybe somebody who's LGBTQIA might not even be able to get a spot in a refugee camp because of their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a coach training program, Courageous Living Coach Certification, and as trainees are in training, earning their hours, one of the things that we're doing through my the Helping the Helpers program that I'm developing is we're reaching out to nonprofits and we're going, okay, your support staff, your secretaries, your people who manage the billing and invoicing, like even if they are not the ones working directly with someone who's in trauma, they are still in an environment where they're vicariously exposed to a lot how might coaching be an adjunct support for those people? Because there's a lot of resources right. for the recipients, but how do we support, how do we help the helpers? Mm. So that's another thing I'm working on. And um, clearly I work on a lot of things and I'm also working on a documentary that's going to come out in the fall. So there's oh, that wow. too. Um, and you can find me at yourcourageouslife.com or teamclcc.com. I had to make the where you find me part really short because I had the long list of stuff I like to work on. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're working on some amazing stuff there. It sounds really, really exciting and like valuable and beneficial to people. It was really cool. Um, yeah. so, so the last question which we like to ask all of our guests is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, God. I, I just love the title. Um, <laughs> being the space for all of it. You know, it's like the reality is that I, th I think that we all have aspects of ourselves, especially under the right circumstances where we can be angels and we can save lives and we can be complete assholes and contribute to really, you know, tearing people down. And it's unfortunate. I have it. You have it. We all have both of those within us. And the ridiculously human is the, the place where, we don't take it all so seriously and we create some space for, for all of it, meaning we're going to love ourselves even when we're at our worst. Mm -hmm. And we're going to really get that we only get this one life that, that we are aware of, right? You know, 
if reincarnation is real, great. But we're, that we're aware of, we get this right here, right now. And nobody ever gets as many days as they'd like. So don't fuck around. Make it count. I yeah. love that. Epic. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> don't get as many days as you want. I love that. That's yeah. really cool. Um, the, yeah. yeah. So, Kate, just wanted to say seriously, thanks so much for coming on our podcast. It was like just so amazing listening to you talk. The, the thing that really stood out for me was just like your authenticity. And I think that that is just makes you like such a relatable person um, because there's no like, there's no like fluffiness. You don't talk rubbish. You actually talk, you know, the real honest, raw truth that most people are thinking and probably struggling with. And that was really, really powerful for me. Um, and yeah, your story, there were so many things in your story where I was like, oh, that happened to me, that happened to me, that happened to me. It's like, really like, I was like, you know, like a, a mirror image of some of the things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, who you are and what you're about um, and what you're doing seriously is so amazing. Like, I really, really love it. I love the concept. I love how you also use science to back everything up for me and, and for Craig as well. That is like a super powerful thing. Um, so yeah, just thanks so much for coming on our podcast. It's been a delight to speak with. I feel like we could sit down with you like over, you know, a couple of beers or a glass of wine or a smoothie, whatever, and, and just chat for <laughs> ladies because there's, uh, there's so much in there and uh, we really just appreciate you and all of your time. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. No, really, it's it's a delight. And next time you're in Sonoma County, dinner's on me. <laughs> cool <laughs> stuff. Thank and you. And just real yeah. briefly from our side, Kate. Uh, yeah, as as we said at the beginning, a, a good campfire conversation, and you made both of us feel super com comfortable. And I'm sure that's how you are in real life as well. So, I mean, just thanks for that. And your use of language and the way you can succinctly explain your some of your concepts is really great. Um, and refreshing as well because it's it's very relatable as Gareth was saying as well and yeah we just the, the value that you bring when you speak is is really great there's so much great stuff in there that's linked also to your vulnerability that um, mm -hmm. that you are open to talking about these things and it adds to that relatability again so thanks for, for that as well and yeah, we can't wait to see all the great stuff that you that you will be busy with in the coming weeks and months and uh, we'll be definitely following uh, all your every move. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. Seriously, really appreciate it. <laughs> cool. cool stuff. Cool Great stuff. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.